welcome back to the Very Short Instructions podcast. New episodes will premiere every Thursday through to June. We hope you stick around and listen. From ancient Greece to branding, globalisation to Homer and logic to fashion, we'll showcase a concise and dynamic insight into a range of diverse topics for wherever your curiosity may lead you. So here is today's Very Short Instruction. Hello, my name is Barbara Graziosi. I'm a professor of classics at Princeton. I'm originally from Italy and after an MA from Oxford and a doctorate from Cambridge, I spent a good part of my life working in the UK before moving more recently to the US. Today, I'm delighted to take part in this celebration and anniversary of the very short introductions because I love this series also as a reader, as well as being very proud to have contributed to it as one of its authors. The title of my contribution is Homer, a very short introduction. And I am happy to say that I have now also been asked to write a very short introduction to Sappho. This gives me the chance to introduce the earliest female as well as the earliest male poet known to us from ancient Greece. Now, as far as Homer is concerned, his identity has been the source of much speculation. So one purpose of my book is to introduce readers to the Homeric question and explain where we are exactly in terms of providing an answer as to when, how, and by whom the Iliad and the Odyssey were composed. Beyond the mystery of composition though, these two epics are also in themselves very surprising artifacts. And perhaps because we think we're familiar with them, we don't quite appreciate this fully. After all, if no literature from ancient Greece had survived, we would assume that it began with short poems destined for specific occasions, for example, wedding songs or funeral laments or lullabies. Instead, what we get are two monumental epics that must have taken at least three days to perform and to appreciate as an audience, and which served no obvious purpose at all. So the second aim of this book is to investigate the appeal of the Iliad and the Odyssey, not just for their early audiences, but also for their many later readers. In terms of key aspects, everyone should, I think, come away from reading my introduction with an understanding of the main literary, historical, cultural, and archeological arguments in Homeric studies. My first aim in this respect is to present the evidence that we have and what we know beyond doubt before entering into the various different theories that have been built on the basis of the little evidence we have. So in this way, I try to make it possible for readers to make up their own minds about the origins of the poems. Beyond the issue of composition, my second and important aim is to introduce the main themes in the Iliad and the Odyssey, and also to give an impression of how they have been read through the ages. The success of the Iliad is astonishing, also because this poem is neither easy nor particularly pleasant. Already in antiquity, listeners struggled to understand its language, And we know that they sometimes fell asleep during the very long recitations that were put on at city festivals. And yet the difficulties posed by the diction and sheer length of the poem are insignificant when compared to the demands that the Iliad makes on our minds and our hearts. This poem confronts many issues that we had rather forget altogether. The failures of leadership, the destructive power of beauty, the brutalizing impact of war, the inability of parents to protect their children, and above all, our ultimate faith of death. The Odyssey also tries to say something fundamental about what it means to be human, and andra, man, is the first word in the poem. But then as we read past that first word, we realize that this is not just a poem about man. It is also a poem about a very specific individual whose main talent is survival and whose aim is to return home. One argument I make is that return and survival in the Odyssey are not the same thing. Return means reaching an end, whereas survival denies an end and even death altogether. 
depending on how we see survival and return play out in the Odyssey, experiences change, not just for Odysseus, but also for those who listen to his story. If we read this poem as a tale of a man who rejects the immortality offered by the divine Calypso and instead decides to return home to his mortal and aging wife on rocky Ithaca, there are lessons to be learned about what it means to be human and the many limitations that condition entails. But if this is a story of survival in which our hero always manages to stay afloat despite suffering the most terrible setbacks, then perhaps the point is not so much learning but enjoyment and entertainment. And so while the actual end of the Odyssey is a disaster, because the poem ends in civil war, something we like to forget, and collective amnesia, but also and more technically because there are lots of textual uncertainties to do with composition and transmission, as if the poet or poets responsible for the end of the Odyssey did not themselves know how to put an end to this tale. The epic is at the same time a celebration of the never-ending power of literature, or so anyway, I argue. Right in the middle of the poem, Odysseus claims that he has descended into the underworld and engaged in quite a few interesting conversations with the dead. It's a tall tale, needless to say, and it exposes Homer's own lies. There is no possible return after all. We all travel in one direction only, towards death. And so the story of the descent into the underworld should not really be in the middle of the poem, but at the end. And yet, for all the difficulties, for all the unlikely tricks and maneuvers, there is in the Odyssey and in its protagonist, and in his many reincarnations in later literature, not just the will to live, but a determination to take pleasure in the tale. One of the reasons I got interested in the subject is indeed the fact that so many different readers have engaged with Homer, offered their own interpretations of the Iliad and the Odyssey, and also tried hard to imagine who composed these epics, thus creating an enormously varied and interesting myth of the author. I also think that my work on Homer will be useful as I now write my new book for this series, a very short introduction to Sappho, that is, since she too is a poet who has haunted the human imagination for almost three millennia. Thank you for listening to the Very Short Instructions podcast. You can subscribe to our podcast on Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, Spotify and Stitcher to receive new episodes directly to your podcast feed. All of our episodes, new and old, can also be found on SoundCloud and YouTube at OUP Academic. Thank you.